Our next panel uh, we, is called The Faces of Mass Incarceration, and we uh, didn't want to end the day without kind of focusing a little bit on uh, some of the unique experiences that people of color have with the system. Uh, and, and of course, we've been referring back to that all day, the, the different treatment that they get and, and so forth and so on, the harsher sentences, et cetera, et cetera. But I think just with a focus on some of the issues that, that, that uh, they can face. And so uh, Lisa has agreed to, to um, uh, moderate that panel for us. And we also have uh, uh, Latanya Graves, who is the uh, very active and energetic president of our Blackhawk uh, chapter of NAACP. And uh, I'm really appreciate you taking the time, uh, uh, Latanya. I know you're uh, multiple involved in many things. And then um, I, I believe we have Will Cole, right? Is he here? Yes. That's you. Okay, great. And uh, he can speak from the perspective of a, of a, a formerly incarcerated person plus uh, other things that he's doing in the community. So Lisa, take it away. Need to unmute. There is a, Un let me unmute myself. So I don't know if others have joined in, but um, once again, my name is Lisa Ambrose and I am the CEO of Amani Community Services where we provide domestic violence and sexual assault services uh, for African-Americans. And um, so part of this panel discussion, like Al said, is mostly talking about the faces of incarceration, who those people are. And so I will let Latanya Grace, who's the president of our Black Hawk NAACP here in Waterloo. We just had a beautiful banquet um, was it a couple of weeks ago, Latanya? <laughs> and she had, and she had the great Belinda Smith Creighton did that. If you guys missed it, oh my gosh, that was my first time hearing the speech. And she she yeah, did right that. that was a wonderful choice, yeah. Latanya, to have yeah, right. <laughs> Belinda come and speak. So. I will let you go ahead and talk about the faces of mass incarceration. Hi, and um, as Lisa said, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Latanya Graves, and I'm the current Blackhawk County NAACP president. And I started my um, social justice activism um, in the 90s and uh, family member slash friend um, was sentenced to a term of 106 years. And he was a first time offender. And um, he, you know, had drugs and they found a gun. However, the gun was not found in the location of the drugs. The gun was found in the garage. And later it came out during the trial that the gun was not even operable. So it couldn't even be used. And so, but because of a law being passed that if um, someone um, was caught with drugs and a gun was found, then the sentence would be enhanced by 50 years. So again, he was a first time offender and was sentenced to 106 years. So in my activism, you know, I found out that there um, was a white guy who was a second time offender and he had more drugs, more money, and even more guns. And he was only sentenced to 40 years. And so in doing my research, I actually wrote a paper on it when I was studying for my bachelor's. And so in doing my research, I also found out that um, his family was prominent and they donated monies to the University of Northern Iowa. So I'm sure that had something to do with um, him only receiving a 40 year sentence. Also um, at that time, we started meeting with lawmakers and judges and, um, and the same story would be repeated. Our hands are tied. You need to lobby the lawmakers. 
And so, um, and we would go to Des Moines and lobby our lawmakers, but of course nothing changed. And at that time, if you were caught with um, marijuana, your sentence would be 18 months to probation, 18 months probation or 18 months imprisonment. So, you know, they would go back and forth with whether you were gonna get 18 months probation or 18 months in prison. And then if you got caught with powdered cocaine, you would get 18 months to five years. If you got caught with meth, um, which is what the, the white gentleman got caught with, meth and marijuana, um, it was five to 10 years, depending on the amount. But if you got caught with crack cocaine, which is derived from coke, it was 20 to life. And so, um, and we always, you know, knew that there was a uh, discrimination in the sentencing laws. And simply because um, at that time, coke was a white man's drug of choice and crack cocaine was the black man's drug of choice. And so when you had such a huge disparity in the sentencing guidelines, um, black men or women were going to serve much longer. And when we started meeting with them, my stance was a drug is a drug is a drug is a drug. And it didn't matter in my eyes if you got caught with marijuana, coke, crack, heroin, or meth. And I um, would say it every time we would meet with them, it's a drug. So if you have the guidelines across the board the same, you're not going to have a disparity. But of course they didn't listen to me or anyone else that was lobbying for the change. And so, um, you know, and then years later, many years later, the laws finally started to change um, but you still had people of color serving all this time for um, drugs. And like I said, he was a first time offender and the white gentleman was a second time offender. And so he actually did 17 years and the white gentleman did 15. So he actually got out two years sooner than... Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and people say, you know, that it, it wasn't based on race, but it was based on race because even now today, um, I was just looking at um, incarceration rates by ethnicity. And so we're still incarcerated um, 304, 340, 300, 3,000, excuse me, 3,473 people um, per 100. That's, I mean, you know, and it's utterly, it's mind boggling for a white person per 100,000 people, 324. So 324 per 100,000. But when it comes to African Americans, 3,473 people of color are incarcerated. Hispanic, 692. Um, American Indian or Alaskan, Alaska Natives, 2,274. So we still have this huge disparity, even though the laws have changed. So in my humble opinion, they have not done enough to rectify this change. I mean, the, these charges that these people receive, they have not done enough to rectify the disproportionate number of African-Americans that are incarcerated. And then um, across the United States, it says that we rank for so many negative reasons is unreal, um, but Across the United States. When you say 600, Iowa, Latanya? Yes. Okay, sorry. Iowa, yes. And so um, it says today, Iowa's incarceration rates stand out internationally. In the United States alone, 
664 people are incarcerated per 100,000 people. In Iowa, 582 people are incarcerated per 100,000 people. So, I mean, that's sad. And I'm not sure what the lawmakers are looking at when um, they're putting these laws into place, but something definitely needs to change. You know, we've been lobbying for 25 years and nothing has changed. There have been slim changes, but nothing to the magnitude that would rectify um, the incarceration rates of minorities. Latanya, when you're lobbying like that, do you know, can you explain or remember any of the comments or some of the reasoning behind what's going on here in Iowa with the um, incarceration rates? It's always, um, if the person has uh, committed an offense, um, if they're a second time offender, if um, it's a violent crime, and most of these cases, they, they were not violent crimes, they were drug crimes. And so um, in any time, and, and my, my thinking is this, anytime, you know, someone commits a violent offense, yes, they should be um, punished severely. That's my personal opinion. But um, people choose to use drugs. You know, you're not, I'm not forcing an individual to use drugs. That's their choice. However, um, in using drugs, sometimes they do commit violent offenses. And if they do, then they should be punished according to the laws. But if it's, if it's just you're selling drugs and um, the person purchasing the drugs chooses to use drugs, you know, I just don't feel that... Um, you should be sentenced like a person that commits a violent crime. And that's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, I know you said there was a person that you knew that had got um, sentenced to a hundred years, which there's somebody else in our family too that uh, got sentenced to that as well and is still serving prison time. Um, I'm not for sure if there was a weapon involved, but I know it was, you know, basically because of um, drugs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and wow. I think we had another family member that got um, sentenced to a lot of time as well. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of Black families here in Iowa that, you know, because of those charges, you know, the families have been affected for our loved ones that are, you know, like you said, locked up. And not to say, not to condone what they did. Or exactly. Anything like that, but um, I think you can get more time doing drugs than if you killed somebody or if you even robbed um, someone. So I'm not for sure how they are equating that to a lost life compared to someone that's, you know, done drugs or or. Uh, selling drugs. Um, it, to me, it just does not make sense at all. But um, does anyone, do you have any other um, comments, um, LaTanya, or does anybody have any questions for LaTanya? I mean, we pretty much know what we've been talking about today. And I think Sue has her hand up. So go ahead, Sue, unmute yourself. Okay. Hello, Latanya. I don't think we've Hi. met, but I've certainly heard a lot of wonderful things about you from Lisa and <laughs> from Al. Um, one of the things that 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 strikes me is that the the disparity between crack cocaine and cocaine, powder cocaine. And I sat in on a a, a conference with Grassley, Senator Grassley. And his reasoning for thinking that people who use crack cocaine should have more punishment than people who use powder cocaine is because crack cocaine users commit more violent crimes than people who use powder cocaine. And my response to that was, I guess it depends on what you consider violent. 
because I think that things like rape and fraud and taking people's money and their savings and sexual abuse in the home, I think those things are just as violent and sometimes with less provocation than street violence. Um, would you, do you have any statistics on- I'm gonna shut my office door. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just closed the office door. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry that you had that distraction. Um, do you have any statistics or any comments on that kind of thinking about people who use crack are more violent than people who use powder cocaine? You know, and that also, um, there was an article I used in one of my research papers and, um, and it, it was from, this information was like from the 60s. And it it was so, in my opinion, so crazy. And I'm like, the article was from the 60s, but everything in that article was happening like present day and is still happening present day. And that article stated that a Black person becomes a crate, a, uh, like a crazed um monster it called it called us monsters the black person becomes like a crazed monster and um and and when i read it i was like like oh my god like are are they serious but that's that's what they called us crazed monsters and so and i'm thinking Okay, so if another person of another race commits a crime in their own drugs, what are they considered? You know, um, and, and, it, and it, it didn't state it anything, but my mind was like, we're crazed monsters, but if a Hispanic individual or um, an Asian individual or, or a white individual um commits a crime what are they looked upon as and so but yeah so it's a stereo stereotype that has um you know been used for decades and so what proof do you have what proof do you have when we have when we have so many school shootings and these school shootings have not been committed by black individuals. So when these people are committing school shootings, are they crazed monsters? You know, and it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's all about race. In my opinion, it's all about race. Uh, yeah, I would just to reinforce what Latanya is talking about a little bit. Uh, the, the national data show that as the length of sentence goes up, the proportion, the disproportionality of black people goes up. So if you look at all sentencing, there's a huge disproportionality. But if you look at just people that are sentenced to 10 years or more, there's an even greater disproportionality for those 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 longer sentences. Now with the crack cocaine, we had a kind of a moral panic about that in the 80s, right? Ever you know, it was going to wreck society and all this stuff about crack babies, which turned out most of it wasn't true. Uh, and then also because the drug dealers were sorting out who was going to sell what, because crack was kind of a new drug and the drug dealers were trying to sort out who was going to sell what, there was some violence associated with that kind of transition to a new drug. But then, then so that's what created this moral panic that justified, you know, these, these stiffer sentences in part. And, and and yet, uh, um, of course, then it gets changed into a stereotype where it's automatically assumed that uh, the certain parts of the drug trade are going to be uh, more violent than than others. So it just is a justification. And and I mean, the, the, the crack baby thing was used as a as a label to imply that particularly black mothers were wildly irresponsible that they were so irresponsible that they were getting their kids addicted to crack. And, and then when they actually analyzed how many 
times that it actually happened, the, the actual numbers were much smaller than people were claiming. Much The actual incidence of crack babies was, was much smaller than, than people claimed, and yet it was being used to stereotype a whole group. So that's just kind of reinforcing some of what she's saying. So. Uh, um, Thank you, Al, for that information. Um, and I just want to piggyback a little bit what Latanya said. There's no proof out there regarding how different races act when they're on drugs. So that's, that's wow, that's eye-opening for someone to even describe another race like that when there's no, there's no evidence, there's no proof, you know, but I guess that's, you know, somebody's biases regarding um, that. Um, well, and that's about the time when Hillary Clinton called the black, young black men, super predators. If right. You guys remember, yeah. All of that kind of fits together, time-wise. Right. Mm -hmm. Was that also when, um, no, that was that in the 80s when, um, who, was, who was the president that really, really cracked down on the drugs? Both, both Reagan and Clinton. Reagan, okay. Mm -hmm. Both of them did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you know, and I always say, how could it, how, okay, you, you came up with um, the slogan, the war on drugs, but, you know, I found countless articles of drugs being confiscated from submarines and jetliners, and 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 in my head, I'm like, oh wow, we're we're, we're we own submarines now, you know, we own private jets now. <laughs> oh wow, you know, and it and it and it's so it's just so amazing that they always go after the person at the bottom of the totem pole never the person at the top of the totem pole because if you were going after the person at the top and it was truly a war on drugs then these people that were bringing drugs in on the submarines and the jet liners and the private jets and all of this they would have been the ones behind bars so it, it was not a war on drugs it was a war on an entire race of people and that in my opinion african americans and even like right now iowa charges the highest rates for phone calls so the person behind bars is suffering but then the families are also suffering and and i'll be honest my son was incarcerated and i kid you not um i sent over the course of that year I sent I $750. And I often think to myself, oh, I could have had a nice vacation. <laughs> $750, I could have taken a nice vacation. And so, um, but the rates are just crazy. And the commissary is crazy. And they're making money, not off of the person incarcerated, but they're making money off of the families that are sending, um, you know, money to to their loved ones that are behind bars, and it's utterly ridiculous, utterly ridiculous. And then we were given an F grade. It says um, we graded the parole release system of all fifty states, and Iowa gets an F. So we're not doing as well as people think. For us to receive an F grade is, is you know, we have to do better. And, and like I said, in lobbying the lawmakers, it, for me, it seems like um, they, they brush you off. Not all of them, but they brush you off. And so, and in my head, I'm thinking like, this is a um, passionate issue. You know, we're the constituents that elected you. And, um, and, and and so I don't know, I don't know what is involved when they go into chambers and, you know, but it's like our issues are not their concern. 
but statistics don't lie. When you see it in black and white, it doesn't lie. So if I'm standing there um, pleading my case, you know, I'm just another individual standing there pleading my case. But when I can pull out information that shows you what has been happening for years and you're still, your heart still isn't pinged to make changes, then I don't know, I don't know what else to do. Thank you for bringing that point up, um, LaTanya. Um, because we talked about earlier too, how that someone being in prison affects the family financially. And I, I, I had a son in prison too for seven years. He's out now, but I probably could have went on a vacation as well for all the phone calls, like you said. Um, you know, it would be cheaper. We could just do a Walmart thing and send them their snacks versus, you know, yes. get from them. But I, I have for, totally forgot about that. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, if there's more questions for LaTanya, we can do that at the end. She's just giving some very phenomenal information. But we also want to hear from Mr. Will Cole, who was formerly incarcerated. So, Mr. Cole, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Willie Cole. I'm 55 years old. I was uh, recently in prison. Uh, 91 days ago. <laughs> so I, uh, I was sent to 75 years in prison. Uh, unfortunately, I did 32 years. Uh, and like I said, I've been on uh, 93 uh, months. Uh, I'm advocating prison is not because uh, we know we have people with antisocial personality disorders. And some people cannot be in society. But what we are talking about today is the prejudice uh, in the systematic that's used to choose who goes to prison, how long they stay in prison, and what they go to prison for. And we know that the victims of crime, our hearts go to because it, it sends people that are affected by crime. And that's very, very serious. Uh, and my heart goes out to the victims of crime. So I'm not here asking prisons are not needed. What we're talking about is the prejudice and the racism attached to people being sent to prison. Because sometimes people look up as, oh, you don't want anarchists, you don't want organizations. You don't. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that when you send a person to prison, that there should be some real rehabilitation factors with them going to prison. That you should mitigating circumstances of how what happened, how the case happened, the the background of the person going to prison, and it shouldn't be based on their race. My race should be a factor in how much time I get, how long you keep me in and what you do to me in prison. So these are the things that we try to fight about and these are the things that we try to make knowledgeable, knowledgeable that, that are not. So I was sentenced 75 years. I was 22 years of age. I was sentenced, um, I was convicted of two robberies and two armed criminal acts, which I am innocent for, still fighting my case Today. Will, Will, make sure you're talking into the microphone because you're cutting out. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was picking the first robbery, and I was given seven years running consecutive. So I was given a twenty-year, a twenty-five-year sentence, and a thirty-year sentence running consecutive and in Missouri when when your sentence ran consecutive you are made to do more time you are made to do more time so instead of me having to do 10 years or 12 years or 13 years like other people I had to do 30 years before I was eligible for parole 
So this made me start thinking about my sentence and other racial group or ethnic group sentences. So I started making chronological logs of people that I came in contact with that came with like or similar crime. And what I started to find out, how do you have a murder and you have 25 years and I have a robbery and I got 75 years? Or how did you get out because I got out and you had 150 years? So it started making me think about and made me start studying history coming back from slavery all the way up to today. And you see an underlining thread with these kind of draconian sentences and with this kind of legislation. So what we deal dealing with, gentlemen, is not something that's, and it's really not new. And like the lady said from the NAACP, you can go and get um, conversations from different leaders and, and, and different uh, freedom fighters 50 years ago. And you can play those things today and they So how was that possible with all relations things that have been happened over these years, decades? So my experience prison, prison being a microcosm of society is that all the injustices, all the in Adequacy, all the prejudice that happened in society happens in prison. So when we start talking about when we start talking about positioning, we, we start talking about where prisons are located, who works in prison, who gets the contract for prison, all those things are the same as society. So I've been to about five different in, in, in the state of Missouri. And in Missouri, when you have a lot of time, send you to the mass security institution. 90% of all mass institutions in Missouri, African Americans, makes up 80 to 90% of the population in those prisons. When you start getting smaller percent five years, six years, you go to lower level institutions. So after I did 31 years in prison and they dropped my level because I, re I received an outdate, I started going to lower level institutions in prison. And 90% of those people out of those prisons was white Americans. It was, I, it was like a culture shock. When I went to those lower level institutions, I just sat there and looked like, I mean, I, I, I really received culture shock. I have never seen that many white offenders in my whole entire incarceration, which spanned it 31 years. So that was like, then I started thinking, like, and I started talking to people, how much time you got? Well, I got 10 years. I got to do two years before I go. What you get locked up for? Oh, I had two robberies. Uh, I robbed four stores, or I robbed three stores, or I had a high speed chase and I ran over and they gave me a DWI and so on and so forth. I'm like, I know people that got 60 years for this. I know friends of mine, 70 years for this. So then you start understanding the racism and the prejudice that's played these sentencing. Even if I was guilty, just think about this one. I'm guilty. I'm a young man. I'm 22 years of age. Why not look at me and say, you know what, young man? It seems like you're off track. I'm going to put you in a program for you to get yourself together. Because prior to this, me being illegally arrested, my only criminal background was in this, in being in possession of a stolen credit device and a burglary. That's it. No guns, drugs, no violence, no anything. So I wasn't a hardened criminal. I had redeemable qualities. You know, you could have you took me and put me in a program, gave me some 
some training, gave me some voc vocational training, and I could have been a productive member of society. But you just disregarded me and threw me away. Not only did you throw me away, you sent me to, to the most high and, and vicious and violent prisons in Missouri. So I'm wondering, judge, like, why would you do me like that? Where in the cool of night, men are being raped and they are crying. Where everybody howling and people are being stabbed and people are dying. The prison was built in the 1800s. So even the conditions, the health conditions of the prison, people dying of water, dying of lead in the, uh, in the pipe. No rats, no running in your cell. In the wintertime, it's so cold that your, your toilet frees up. That's the kind of condition that I was thrust through at 22 years of age. So I'm saying, where is the, the rehabilitation of uh, 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 that? If I was your son, would you have did me that way? If I was another, if I was another group, would you have did me? So what bothers me, when you looked at me, you, you didn't see yourself, you didn't see nephew, you, you didn't see your cousin, you didn't see nothing human, you didn't see anything that was redeemable or that could have been used in society. So these are the things that we talk about when we're talking about these draconian sentences. When you take a human, throw them away. Then when I get out of it, there's nothing here. If it wasn't for Sue and her organization, uh, I don't know what I'd do. I do. I'm just being honest with you. Because when you come out here, they have organizations that'll help you, but there is nothing immediate. So you have to fill out an application to get help on, on electricity. You have to fill out an application to get help on food. You have to fill out an application to get uh, psycho psychological evaluations. But none of them things matter when you are hungry right now. Like there is no immediate help when you come to prison. All the level five institutions have anything for you because they feel you're not getting out anyway. Most of the people in level five don't get out. And if they do get out, it's 40, 50, 35, 27, 19 years from now. So they don't care. So they don't prepare you for society. They don't give you anything that you can use to be a productive member in society. So they send you out ill prepared. They send you out old. All my most productive years was spent in prison. So the time where people are raising their family, people are saving money for college. So I don't even have social security because I haven't worked. And then you go try to get a job and the job tell you, we can't hire you because you. Now I'm like, wait a minute. So you give me 75 years because of a crime, the crime was serious. You give me 75 years, okay. You make me do 30 years of the 30 of the 75 because you say it was serious, okay. Then I come to the street and tell me you won't hire me because of the crime that I could. So how can I pay my debt to I mean, is it ever gonna be a time where I can redeem myself. So these are the things, these are real. And I really appreciate, really, really appreciate y'all taking your time and fight because we need people like the people that's on this panel. And it might not seem like it's, it might not seem like it's working, but because I'm hearing conversations today that I've never heard in my time of incarceration. When you start talking about disparity in sentences, we've been talking about this 
25, 20 years ago when people used to tell us, man, shut up and do your time. We don't care about none of that. Now we're talking about this. Now we got that's trying to fight for sentences to be even. If a person does something that is against the law and you sentence him accordingly, I don't have no problem with that. But when you use racist tactics, when you send me to prison to enrich different communities, then I have a problem with that. There is no prisons in Missouri in African American neighborhoods. None. No prisons in Missouri. So think about this. We ravage our community. Gang members, we shoot drugs, prostitution. You lock us up. You send us two, 300 miles away to a whole community that we never violated any laws, ordinance, or, 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 or code. And you extract, like the lady said, look how much money she sent to, to her son. That money never went to the community where he came from. So you take us and you put us out there and you extract the nutrients from our family to enrich the neighborhood where you sent us to. If you look up Bond Term, Missouri, there's nothing in Bond Term, Missouri, but Eastern Reception died Correctional Center. They hire over 300, almost 400 people. There's nothing there. So my family spend money to visit me. Sometimes they get a hotel in Bond Term. Sometimes they get hamburgers. So the thing is, what we're fighting is, it's a system. If they had a pill right now that they can give to anybody that has ever committed a crime and you would never commit a crime again, they would never give it to you. Because there's too many people eating. They have prisons on the stock market. Look up the American a Prison Corporation. So what we're fighting about is not all cold. What we're fighting about is not the, the safety of the public. We are fighting against commerce. We are fighting the people are getting jobs. People are working. People are getting 401k uh, 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 retirement plans in this prison system. So, like I say, again, I applaud everybody that fights. Um, my heart is, is happy today because it's like just to know someone cares out here uh is a big thing I talk to guys from prison every day i don't think it's a day to talk to somebody from prison and i'm letting those guys know that it might seem dark uh it might seem like people don't care people out here that cares miss sue hutchinson she has counseled me she has encouraged me. She has supported me, her and her organization. And like I say, if it wasn't for her, I I don't, I really don't know what I would do. So, you know, my hat goes off to my organization and being very instrumental in my rehabilitation. Uh, right now I have three outfits. I'm 55 years old. I have three, maybe four outfits. I live with my son and, and her two daughters, and she's disabled. I don't have a job yet. I just applied for Amazon, and I just got an email today, unfortunately, and they told me they hired me because of my criminal background. Correct? So, bills of study, this is real life issues here. The, the All the money and the resources the Missouri Department of Correction extracted from me and my family, there is nothing available for me right now. So like, again, you know, my heart goes, I'm, I'm really uh, appreciative of allowing me to speak. If anybody would like to get in contact with me, uh, you can get in contact with me through Ms. Hutchinson. Uh, any questions or comments, I'm willing to answer. But like I say, it's a very, very, very system uh, and I'm glad that, you know, there's people out here 
that is fighting and, and, and care. Thank you, Mr. Cole, for sharing your story. Um, I was just about to ask you what you were doing right now as far as, <clears throat> so it's it's been still a struggle for you to find a job. Yeah, yes, ma'am. And you're not in Iowa, right? You're still in, you're in uh, Missouri? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a compelling story. Um, and, and you did make another point. You said, you know, all this time that you've been in prison, there was no, there was nothing to help you be rehabilitated because it was almost like they thought you was never gonna get out. So there's nothing to help people in prison for when they do get out. Is that what you're stating? Well, they have things now that can help, but most of those things are level institutions, right? So most guys in five institutions, they make it to level level one or two institutions. And if you do make it to a level one or two institution, by the time you make it there, if you sign up for none of the program, they usually take three months. 18 months. By the time You're I muted, made it, Will. Time I made it. By the time You're I You're muted. Huh? No, I'm not. You're muted. Am I muted? No, no we can hear you. Okay. About the time I made the level one institution, they had a, a they had a they had a roofing program called Trimco, but they wouldn't let me in the roofing program because I didn't have enough time left to take the course. Because I only had a year left. The course is longer than a year. That's kind of the, the dilemma that you go through when you have those very, very long sentences. Lower level institutions have programs that will help you in society. Higher level institutions, they just throw you away. I think, I think this is something that as activists, we always need to scrutinize the claims that DOC and others make about all the programs they have available. Because having the program available in theory doesn't mean that somebody like Will is in a position to really take advantage of it. And so uh, this is, I've heard this before about other kinds of rehabilitative programs. They won't do them until you get to be a certain, uh, you know, they won't do them until you get to clo being close to being out, but sometimes you actually delay being out so you can finish the program or else you don't have enough time left to finish the program. So the gap between what people claim is happening uh, to benefit people in prison and what's actually happening, you know, is, is something we all need to, 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 to keep in mind. Uh, when, when people start even talking about rehabilitation, we have to make sure that the rehabilitation that's being offered is something that people can really use. And, and that's just, you know, uh, uh, Will's story is something that I've heard echoed, uh, you know, before about this sort of thing. So, I mean, it's a, I'm, I'm glad he shared it, but it, I, 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 I tell you, I wish I were so more surprised by some of the things you were saying, Will, because <laughs> we've, you know, it's like, God, <laughs> Just we hear it, we hear it from all all angles, and it, it get really frustrating. But anyway, that's that's what I'll say. I'll say about it. But, uh, uh, Mr. Cole, that was my son's experience too. That as he was in prison, they would say, "It's sorry, it's too soon for you to take that program. It's too soon," and then it was too late. So my heart goes out to you. I hope you find a job real soon. Yes, ma'am. You know, can I um, chime in? It's just like, um, you know, even though my son, he signed up for various programs, but then it took like three months, you know, a waiting list. And so by the time his name came up, you know, um, three weeks later, he was being released. And I've always also lobbied that as soon as a person um, enters the door of the prison, you should have programs available for them that day. Because if you're truly rehabilitating, 
And this is what you say the person was sent to prison for to rehabilitate them. So if you're truly rehabilitating people, then whatever programs you have available, they should be offered to the person as soon as they enter those prison doors, because whether they have five years or 20 years, they should be offered those programs. And I remember um, my ex, like he, um, he had, he, he received a 10 year sentence and he did eight. However, um, his goal was to do everything he needed to do. Um, and because it was federal, you know, there was no early parole, but his goal was to do everything he needed to do. And even in the federal system, he wasn't given the opportunity to participate in any of the programs until like 18 months before he was to be released. And so, and in my mind, I'm like, why, why do they wait until a person is about to be released if you're truly about rehabilitation? And we all know that that's not the case. It's a money, it's a money, it's a money thing. And in the prison systems, like my son, he was working in the prisons. I would they make 25 cents an hour or something like that. Um, I got to tour his prison and it was it was just unbelievable how they had everything set up. Like these these men were they were at desks like oh, I'm at work and they had their little their shoes and they're out there, you know, the jumpsuits or whatever that they had. It was just like they were really in a real business. And I just kept looking at them thinking, how come they couldn't be out in society working like that? Like, how come they don't have a chance to get out when they do get out to have something like that, to be able to give back? Um, or at least getting paid while they're there. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So that they could have some money when they got out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mm -hmm. truly think that the interest in rehabilitation is zero and that's it. And I think that there's a big, that the American public has been duped into thinking that rehabilitation happens. Yeah, it's pretty mad, pretty missing. I was gonna say, if anybody knows any other programs, I know, you know, here we got um, like maybe one city is one of the programs that helps people when they get out of prison. I don't, I'm not sure, Will, you know, if they have something like that, you know, where you're from, but I guess I can look into it and give that information to Sue um to see but um i wish you the best um i i thank you for telling your story and sharing with this panel today and we all just wish you the best um, Thanks for you're welcome we got about 10 more minutes in this session but if anybody has still any more questions or comments for latanya miss latanya or will you can go ahead and take it away you got about 10 minutes Maybe nine now. <laughs> uh, well, Tanya, one thing you didn't talk about was the some of the advocacy work that you do at the uh, at the the front end of the system and trying to make sure that people are 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 treated fairly at the because often the NAACP is you know the one that gets the call when people feel they're being treated unfairly. Can you can you talk about your various encounters with our our so-called justice system here in Blackhawk County. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and so what I try to do is when we receive calls, um, depending on um, what the complaint is in regards to, if it's criminal um, versus housing versus job discrimination, we have different committees. So I'm on the criminal justice committee and, um, and what we do, um, if a person calls and says that an officer used excessive force, then we're able to go and view the video. And in some instances, it is the case. And in some instances, the person um, resisted, but the officers gave them multiple opportunities to just stand there and be arrested and, and, you know, and sometimes the person was highly intoxicated and you can hear the officers saying, you know, I just need you 
to stand there so I can handcuff you. And then of course, if you're intoxicated, you're using all kinds of foul language. And, but there's been, like I said, instances where they um, gave them a command, 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 command. And then finally, okay, we're taking the person down. And then there's been cases where, um, you know, and this was even before the George Floyd incident, there was a, a situation where the officer, the person was the victim. And, um, and they kept trying to explain to the officer that they were the victim. And the officer still commanded the person to get down on the floor and they're steady saying, no, I'm the victim, I'm the victim, I'm the victim. And then the officer finally slams him on the floor and then actually put his knee on his neck. And, and, and I'm just looking at this like, I just I just couldn't believe it. And I remember meeting with, at that time, um, Dan Trelka was the police chief. And I remember after we reviewed um, the video, you know, some of the members were like, well, Latanya, he didn't comply. And I said, I said, I understand he didn't comply, but he was also telling the officers that he was the victim. I said, my issue is when he threw him to the floor, he put his knee on his neck. And I mean, held it there. And so um, at that time, you know, Dan's response, well, he's one of the more aggressive officers. And I just wanted, I just, I just wanted to scream like that's, that's, that's excusable because he's one of your more aggressive officers. So it was okay. And so, and I also um, tell our members, like when we go to court with individuals, we're not there to say if the person is guilty or innocent. We're there to make sure the process is fair. We're there to make sure if this person was charged with crime A, B, and C, then we want to ensure that, especially if, if they're African-American, then, um, and, and we, I've gone to court with um, um, Caucasian men, you know, and so, and again, uh, when we show up, they're looking like, oh, wow, yeah. And I'm like, because we fight for the rights of all people. We don't discriminate, you know? And so, um, again, our goal is just to make sure the process is fair. And so, and oftentimes it's not, you know, and I've, um, I've met with, uh, our county attorney, and I've also written letters to the judges um, when we've been in court, and I've seen different things take place, and and I just you know told them what I saw, and and I remember one time um, being in court. Um, it was a couple months ago, and the prosecutor, um, the the young man was um, standing in front of the judge, and she allowed someone that was there with him to to come up front with him and the prosecutor when the young man was speaking she was mimicking him and I just and I and I was just like I I could not believe it but I saw it with my own two eyes she was mimicking him speaking to the judge and I was just I, I went to try to find the county attorney um, he wasn't in his office but, you know, I left a message for him, you know, you need to call me because you need to handle this. And it's very unprofessional when you have um, people like that that work for, um, you know, the state. It's very unprofessional. But she actually, she acted, and she didn't see me sitting there. That was one thing. And so, um, but yeah, because I walked in while he was standing there talking and then you know and she's just I was just like I, I just I could not believe it I could not believe it so for, yeah for, 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 for Latanya to be shocked it's got to be bad since all the stuff she's seen is but <laughs> and I, I tell you right now and when Latanya first told me that story about the the knee on the neck I thought we were that far from George Floyd right here mm -hmm. in our own community. Mm -hmm. You know, that was really, that, that, and of course I, I, I witnessed excessive force being used on a black person when, uh, uh, when I was on the jury that time. So 
I, I know it, 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 it really happens. And um, uh, it's just, well, I mean, we need, we need folks like Latanya out there on the front line dealing patiently with the, uh, this, this kind of stuff on a daily basis. And I really appreciate uh, the work that she does with that. Um, I think we're going to transition into my last little half an hour deal right now. And um, so uh, uh, thanks to everyone that's participated.